In this video, we want to think about the circulation of blood through the tissues at a microscopic level. Now, we know that blood is delivered to the tissues via an arterial and it drains via a venule. And in between, we have the capillaries. So let's think about the capillaries and what's going on at the level of the capillaries. So the capillary walls are made out of vascular endothelial cells. And these cells are flattened squamous cells. Each with their own nucleus, cytoplasm and cell membrane. Cells which have this flat shape we refer to as squamous. And it's a vascular endothelium because it's lining the vasculature, the blood circulatory system. And the capillaries are very narrow, the systemic capillaries. And here we have the individual cells that are making up the wall of this capillary. Now, as we know, blood is going to arrive from an arterial into a network of capillaries. Now, I've only drawn one capillary here. In reality, of course, in tissues, there are millions. And that's a very easy thing to prove. So if I ask you just to compress your nail bed like that, you'll see that it goes white. And then when you let go, you'll see it goes pink again as the capillaries are reperfused with blood. So the reason it goes white when you press it is because the pressure from your fingernail is occluding the capillaries. It's squeezing shut the capillaries in the capillary bed in your fingernail beds. And then when you let go, the blood pressure in your finger is reperfusing those capillaries. So millions of capillaries on a microscopic scale, but the blood comes from arterioles, and the blood will drain via venules. And going through the capillary, we're going to have red blood cells, the erythrocytes or the red blood cells. You might remember these are the biconcave discs, darker on the outside and lighter on the inside. And here we see the scale because these red cells are about seven micrometers in diameter. That is seven one thousandths of a millimeter. And we see in this case, they're going through the capillary just one cell at a time. Now a tissue is a group of similar cells with connective tissue in a blood supply. So here we have some tissue cells. This capillary is perfusing these tissue cells. So here we have the tissue cells. Now, when the blood enters the capillary, it's entering from an arterial. And of course, the pressure in the arterial system is higher than the pressure in the venous system. So at the arterial end of the capillary, we might get a blood pressure of something like 32 millimetres of mercury because this blood has just been fed in by the arterial system, via the arteriole. But as it goes through, well, we know that the pressure in veins is lower than the pressure in arteries. And this is going to feed into the venous system, so the pressure is going to be lower, maybe about 12 millimetres of mercury at the venous end of the capillary. Now... We've got red cells in the blood, of course, and we also have plasma proteins. The most ubiquitous plasma protein, the most common plasma protein, is albumin. Very large molecule, albumin. So let's go to the arterial end of the capillary and think about this physiology. Well, here we have the blood coming in at relatively high pressure. But we notice that there are small gaps between the individual capillary cells. And because the blood is at fairly high pressure, 
water molecules will be pushed out from the blood, from the plasma, into the interstitial spaces, into the tissue spaces. And this is good because this means that we get the accumulation of tissue fluid in the tissue spaces or interstitial fluid. And actually, at any one time in the body, you've probably got about five litres of blood, but ten litres of tissue fluid. There's also about 30 odd litres of fluid in the cells as intracellular fluid. <clears throat> that actually shows quite nice, nicely how body fluids are compartmentalised. Intravascular fluid, interstitial fluid, both of which are extracellular, they are outside of cells. And in here, the intracellular fluid inside the trillions of cells that make up the body. So the tissue fluid is forming at the arterial end of the capillary because the hydrostatic pressure of the blood is relatively high. So we get tissue fluid forming. Is this a good idea or is it a bit of a nuisance? Is it good to have tissue fluid? Well, of course, it certainly is because the oxygen from the red cells has to diffuse into the tissue fluid before it can diffuse into the cells themselves. And likewise, waste carbon dioxide produced by the tissue cells will diffuse into the tissue fluid before it can diffuse into the blood to be transported away to the lungs to be breathed out. So we see that the interstitial fluid is the essential medium, the diffusional medium, for gaseous exchange to occur between the blood and the tissue cells, in this case, systemic tissue cells of the body. But of course, the cells need other things as well. They need glucose. So again, that has to diffuse from the blood into the tissue fluid before it gets into the cells. Vitamin C is needed by the cells. So again, it's got to go from the blood to the tissue fluid, into the cells. So anyway, it's going to get there. Waste products of metabolism, maybe nitrogen containing waste products produced by the cells as a result of protein metabolism, for example, needs to get back into the blood so it can go to the liver, be converted into urea to be excreted via the renal system. So the tissue fluid is the essential medium of exchange, diffusional exchange, between the blood and the cells. So it's absolutely essential. And all the time, this relatively high hydrostatic pressure inside the vessel, the hydrostatic pressure is the pressure of the fluid. It's the blood pressure inside the vessel, about 32 millimetres of mercury, forcing out tissue fluid. That's good. But of course, it means that we're producing tissue fluid all the time. This process is going on all the time because all the time you have hydrostatically you know, blood pressure, the hydrostatic pressure, the blood pressure, which is the hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries. It is there all the time. Otherwise, your tissues wouldn't be perfused. So how do we stop it from accumulating? Because we don't want too much. That would be edema, wouldn't it? We don't want to be edematous. And because we have these large albumin molecules, and indeed other plasma proteins, present in the plasma, this is going to generate an osmotic suction pressure. Now osmosis is the movement of water from a watery area to a less watery area. It's a dilution effect. And because the gaps in the individual capillary cells or between the endothelial vascular capillary cells are small, the proteins don't get out because the proteins are big molecules. They don't get out. So the little water molecules can get out. The little sodium molecules can get out. The, well, sodium ions can get out. The potassium ions can get out. The chloride ions can get out. They can get out 
and the distribution of water and sodium and potassium and chloride will actually be the same between the blood plasma and the tissue fluid because those things can move out easily they're small very small atoms and ions and small molecules but the protein is big molecule can't get out no it's not supposed to get out so what that means is we end up with a an area here in the tissue fluid that is watery because the small molecules have got out but the big molecules that make the blood a colloid can't get out and they're still there so what that means is that the tissue fluid is a relatively watery area whereas this because a lot of the space is taken up in the plasma with the plasma proteins is a less watery area and that means that the water molecules are going to come back in by the process of osmosis being sucked in by the plasma proteins and we can actually measure this and it turns out that it's about 25 millimeters of mercury that is the pressure the osmotic pressure sucking water molecules back in so at the arterial end of the capillary the hydrostatic pressure at 32 millimetres of mercury was greater than the osmotic pressure trying to suck the water back in at, at uh, 25 millimetres of mercury, trying to suck it back in. So tissue fluid is formed at the arterial end of a capillary because the hydrostatic pressure is greater than the osmotic pressure. But we've got this pressure of 25 millimetres of mercury sucking in. And when we look to the venous end of the capillary, we remember that the hydrostatic pressure, that is the blood pressure at the venous end of the capillary, has now dropped to 12 millimetres of mercury. So now the force trying to push water molecules out is only 12 millimetres of mercury. But the osmotic pressure is still there, trying to suck it back in, and that's 25 millimetres of mercury. So at the venous end of the capillary, we notice that the osmotic pressure is now greater than the hydrostatic pressure. And that means that the tissue fluid is going to be osmotically reabsorbed at the venous end of the capillary. Completing a sort of microcirculation, washing fluid over the tissue cells, which of course is good. So we have the microcirculation of the blood and this microcirculation of tissue fluid. The tissue fluid providing the essential diffusional medium to maintain the viability of the tissue cells. So we notice that tissue fluid is formed at the arterial end of the capillary because the hydrostatic pressure is greater than the osmotic pressure. And we notice that tissue fluid is reabsorbed at the venous end of the capillary because the osmotic pressure is greater than the hydrostatic pressure. So we generate this microcirculation to maintain the viability of the tissue cells.